You're not necessarily the the Rolling Stones of the board game world, but you might be the Tom Waits of the board game world, <laughs> which is even cooler. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators. And today I'm joined by Kyle Farron of Leader Games. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks. This is cool. I've actually met you once at a convention, and as soon as you found out that I was from Alaska, you started throwing up some like gang signs at me, uh, which immediately gave me a, a connection to you. You, you want to demonstrate for the audience uh, what that is and what the heck you're talking about? Well, you said you're from Alaska, and I said, where on Alaska are you from? Because this, this is Alaska, and Juneau anchorage yeah exactly i i'm from <laughs> juno uh now i guess i grew up in the anchorage area but that felt like you had access some of our like forbidden knowledge i'd never met someone who didn't <laughs> live or come from alaska that knew of the hand sign in order to demonstrate the overall geography of our state and uh, I, I think you said that your uncle lived up here yep. for a time, maybe was stationed up here. What, uh, what's the deal with my, that? My uncle lived in Alaska. He's a, he's a flight paramedic. Um, so he'd ride in the helicopters and go help people. And he decided he was done in Alaska and made a switch to Arizona. I don't know if he's regretting that choice now. It's pretty... <laughs> it's pretty hot <laughs> in Arizona right now. but Major difference. Did you difference. ever get a chance to travel up here? I haven't been yet. Nope. Oh, okay. No, well, kind of what, what was your childhood? Where'd you grow up? Utah. Yep. Grew up in northern Utah um, in a town called Farmington. And now I live one town north of there in Kaysville. So. <laughs> hey, I didn't move too far from the home base either, though Alaska is pretty expansive. So yep. I guess Anchorage to Juneau is a, a little bit of a difference. It's there. the distance. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Let's talk about your childhood. You are are known for these incredibly imaginative illustrations. You're the artist at Leader Games. Of course, there are other artists uh, who who uh, contribute art to Leader and work at Leader. I, I've talked with Nick Brockman on here, and he's done graphic uh, design and other illustrations and everything. But when people think of Leader Games, they think of you and these adorable and fascinating and, and imaginative illustrations. And a lot of that is uh, the these these characters that feel so original. When you were a kid, like, can you think back to the first time where you did an illustration of an original character? It wasn't your mom, it wasn't your dad, it wasn't your dog or your brothers or your teacher, something entirely your own. Hmm. Well, we, uh, I, I remember distinctly that there was a rabbit, like an Easter bunny type thing that I drew in kindergarten. And my teacher told my parents at a conference, hey, this is really good for a kindergartner. And like they were like, okay, they didn't know. I'm the oldest kid. <laughs> they were like, we don't know what the, we don't right. know what like the age progression is on that. And both my parents are really creative, just not with um, necessarily with drawing stuff, but they would do like crafting things. And my dad does a lot of good woodworking stuff. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I, I would just draw, kind of for fun. And then I think, you know, all through my childhood I would draw Garfield and Calvin and Hobbes and just kind of whatever was available to me and so when I was doodling I, I didn't really ever have like a headspace for like this is an original character <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't ever I wasn't ever like creating a lore around something but I would draw for my siblings or just draw stuff for fun um, and then about high school time I was like I want to become a comic artist like having no idea how much work that was <laughs> Um, and, and then delving a little bit into that. And like, now I have friends that do comic stuff and I'm just like, never, <laughs> I think that looks, that, that's a lot of effort. That's a lot of effort for real for the, the, the deadlines constantly. And then having to redo things based off of, you know, the, the storylines changing, um, the, the comic industry is a whole beast, but like, what what was that transition when you got to around high school age? Were, were you just super interested in comic books or was there any particular uh, comic book artist that made like profound impacts on you that stylistically started uh, filtering into your work? Um, I really liked 
some of like because the only comic book stuff that I had really encountered because I, di- I didn't I mean I didn't even buy comic books I would just watch comic book TV shows and I loved like the X Men. That's a way to do it, man. Come on, the the X Men, Batman, yeah, and a lot of Batman animated series. And so, like, I grew up watching like the Bruce Tim type illustration stuff from Batman, and then um, a lot of the a lot of the '90s X Men stuff was seemed like it was a lot of Rob Liefeld inspired stuff, which is funny to say now because I don't <laughs> consider him like an especial inspiration now. But like at the time. I, I really got into like drawing with ink and stuff because I loved how dynamic, uh, like those those lines, uh, and and the ink work was on Liefeld stuff or like Todd McFarlane's Spawn stuff. And like, there's no way I read a Spawn comic as a kid. I can't imagine <laughs> <laughs> me doing that or my parents allowing that if they knew what it, if they knew what it was. But like, I can you know almost trace you know, a, a direct line through like, just like seeing comic book stuff, trying it myself and like going back and forth and being like, I can, you know, I can imitate this. I can make this my own. Um, and, uh, th- where, where that transitioned into um, board game stuff was, um, me kind of applying what I liked about drawing to making like D and D characters, you know, drawing mm-hmm. my own D and D stuff. Or when I first got onto Twitter, you know, 10 or 11 years ago, I, I just, that's how I tried to get more followers is be like, Hey, for the next 24 hours, if you have a D and D character, I'll draw it for free. I would never do that now. <laughs> <laughs> but like when I, when I was basically invisible, I, I did that and it got me, you know, a few friends that are still my friends on Twitter today. And, um, uh, but, but that, that spread into just like kind of me being known in certain circles for doing that, that led to some work for, um, like I did some spot illustrations for dungeon world, um, which is an, a uh, role-playing game. Um, one image in particular was just like a sheet of goblins, mm-hmm. um, all in a stack. And, um, when David Somerville, who was the original, uh, designer for vast, when he was prototyping that game, he was using that goblin illustration and my name kind of came along with the, with the, the title when he sold it to Patrick leader and said, Hey, you got to check this guy out. And so Patrick sent me a line like, Hey, you know, would you be interested in doing this? And I was, I was so professional. We joked around about it now. I was so professional when I responded to his email. He was like, this guy acts like he's been burned before. <laughs> and uh, so, so I laid out a contract. I laid the number of revisions I was willing to do and, and all that stuff. And then Vast took off enough that, um, I mean, I'm kind of doing the fast version of everything, but Vast took off enough that um, hired me on uh, as basically the first Leader Games employee. Um, and it was kind of contract to employee to um, when when we did Root, it was all full time, and that the became my my job. It went from being kind of a fun side hustle thing to something I was focusing on more with my free time, and then my full time job now. So at this point, you are so identified uh, by Fast, by Root, Oath, Fort, you know these leader games, uh, and at least the the initial releases before Oath. Um, everything kind of had this this cuter aesthetic right you know th- there's variance there's a stylistic difference between vast and for and root for sure but i i think people would you know identify the the leader house style as being this very cute and almost like silly imaginative take on fantasy but when i look at a lot of your illustrations outside of leader games especially uh, some great illustrations that you did of like the classic D&D archetypes, that they're so different than uh, what I, I've come to know you uh, from from your work at Leader. Do you ever feel like by being a, a house artist, you know, a full-time artist with a specific company, uh, that that kind of limits your stylistic output do you find avenues to be able to express yourself in different ways uh, uh, that's a good question the, the um the interesting thing about working as an illustrator versus like a, a fine art um a fine art illustrator is that um, a lot of times you're executing somebody else's vision mm-hmm. like you're um 
you're, you're not in control of what the end product would be. But I have a unique um, relationship with Leader Games in that, like, as being a, the studio person and one of, like, not really a founding member, but one of the first like people at leader games from the very beginning. Right. Like I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of trust there. And so if I like when we were doing Oath, I did take it in kind of more serious direction. Totally. And um and, and I was like, mm, I don't like that there's not I'm not communicating the humor that Oath can offer in its emergent storytelling. And with all of the games that we make, do I feel a little bit like narrowed into what what we're working on not really because i'm trying to sort of tap into what the game is trying to be like people if they levy any criticism at roots at roots art they'll say oh it's a much meaner game than the art looks and it's like but that's intentional like it's it's supposed to kind of trick you into the playing this game that you wouldn't normally play and the fact that it is cute like richard scary type type animals makes it makes something that would normally be gruff and and almost off-putting into something funny like if, if you were playing any other game and you walked into a clearing and bought a crossbow and then shot the shopkeeper with the crossbow like that that that's a little bit dire unless you know it's like a raccoon who comes into a clearing <laughs> of rabbits and does it like it, it's not as like it's not as it, well, it sort of flavors <laughs> that entire experience and so the same thing happened with oath which is like this is like what we eventually landed on with Oath is is the way Cole framed it, and I like this. He was like fantasy by way of like Rich, or, uh, Jim Henson. Yeah, like, yeah, everything's everything's a little muppety. Everything's a little bit funny, um, and you can still like create serious stuff with it. But the humor is what is what makes it enjoyable. I think. Right, but I don't necessarily think that there is like an ironic take on it that you know like oh root is so cutthroat but it's so cutesy you know like that that's such a limited perspective that someone might have on something especially in you know the the 2000s now we're in 2021 um to to be like oh well if it's cartoony then surely it can't reflect you know a, a serious or or mature take on a world and i don't mean mature in a graphic sense but mature as in like complex well, or... well and i'm not even setting out to create something like bojack horseman the game yeah you know? yeah I'm not, exactly. I'm not trying to say like haha this is i got you that kind of thing but like the the overall tone of the art that i make for the games is made as a way to visually solve a problem that is like how the game purports itself, how it, mm. how it presents itself to an audience. And like, like you said, we're in, we're in 2021 now. And if anybody thinks that they're selling a board game with substandard art and any sort of wider market and, and something that's not accessible or eye catching, like they're going to have an uphill battle. I'm not saying it's impossible, but there are much worse games with good art that make it than than, than fantastic games with crummy art, at least, at least initially, I think some of those things have staying power. It's my job to get people to start playing the game and, and it's, you know, Cole and Patrick and everybody who's designing the games. It's their job to sort of keep it in people's consciousness and, and keep it on, you know, the hotness on board game geek or, you know, give people the word of mouth so they can spread it from once like, Oh, this game is actually really good. And then, you know, then they'll hold up the game and somebody who might think, Oh no, this guy always recommends me board games. They'll look at it and be like, Oh, I'd actually play that or I'd give that a shot. Um, and, and it sort of lets them push past, uh, especially since our rule books are, are what we joke around at work about them being like this, this many pages and no guard <laughs> and no guardrails. All leader games will let you sink your own ship if, if you want. Right. Um, but, but it's accessibility or for, not, I keep using accessibility. It's not like, not what I mean by that. I guess it's, it's comfortableness. It's, um, just like how approachable, I mm -hmm. guess is a better word, it is. It, it lets people push past that initial blockade that all board games have, which is like, I can't just push a button through a tutorial as it teaches me how to do it. I actually have to like learn how to play this. And in some cases, teach other people how to play it. And the more welcoming and for approachable that is, the better. Approachability is really important, but do you think about the, the, the artwork, the illustrations as a means to facilitate uh like 
engagement with it. You know, like board games are fundamentally abstract, right? You know, you are not actually fighting with uh, this army against another army. It's representations of, you know, thematic concepts, right? And when you're illustrating a card that has, you know, say Cole has come up with this incredibly abstract text, but he's telling you, well, this is what this is supposed to represent. Do you view your role as, well, I need to make a pretty picture of that event? Or do you view your role as translating the the mechanical function into a thematic concept that hopefully makes it easier uh, to, to cement what's supposed to happen as a reflection of that card. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so the, the trust level is, is super important for this. To give you an example that hopefully answers this question, when we were working on Oath, when we had finally kind of settled on an art style that we wanted to do, mm -hmm. I'd maybe illustrated 10, maybe 15 cards um, in a couple different ways so we could kind of settle on something. Um, done different colorways and things. And when we finally had settled on that, um, I was like, it's art list time, you know, Let, let's get a card list going. Um, game is still in development, so the card list isn't complete, but they're going to be, we knew they're going to be 200 plus cards in Oath and that they're all going to be, there are no repeats. So that finds its way to me in, in, in an Excel document, essentially. Right, a, right. A, just a huge list. And that list is, not descriptions of what the art is. The it, the list is the name of the card, mm -hmm. subject to change, and loosely what it does. <laughs> and then and then I did all the art based off that. So if there was a card that said salad days, like then then Cole could tell me what he thought he meant by that, or I could think I could look at the the card and and look at what it did and then try and get something to match it and in in all my time doing root cards doing the the alternate root deck doing the oath deck doing the vast cards I can only think of like times less than the fingers on my right hand how many times they've asked me to do a different take on the art because because that that's really my job like making it pretty is sort of just like the, the you're a set of hands version of what an illustrator does. And I really don't like working in that kind of setting. Cause then mm -hmm. I just feel like other people and they're like, I need a circle and I need this many things. And I know totally. I would rather have somebody just say, this is the vibe. This is the, the feeling I'm trying to evoke. If there are certain graphical elements that need to be included or need space, that's fine. But give me the parameters, like give me how big it needs to be get me what you're trying to communicate. And then it's my job as a visual communicator to turn that into something that, that makes sense, that is evocative, that, that th makes you think, cause, cause the whole point in oath is that every card should be good. Like er if you, if you pick up three cards and you have to discard down to one, that should be the hard choice. And, and so you want to be able to look at the cards without even really knowing what they do and think, Ooh, that's funny. Or, Oh, I bet I could get that to work with this other card that I have. And that, that first blush feeling is almost as important as mechanically what the card does, because it gives people, um, gives people a feeling of how it works. We, um, we played oath on Friday and I posted a picture on Twitter, like, Hey, we accidentally made an olive garden. <laughs> and it was just a, it was just a co combination of like the walled garden card, the salad days card. And then, um, uh, a long-awaited return and some other things that just kind of gave it the feeling of a an Olive Garden chain restaurant. Um, and since then, we've had a few people who have sent me pictures of funny card combos, and they're like, I'm playing Oath as a bard. And it was like they had a harp, they had you know, a couple cards that were all kind of bard-themed, and those were not drawn in a group, but they were drawn bro broadly enough that like if those things get put together, then people could kind of theme it themselves. And that's that's exactly what I'm going for you know that's that's exactly what I want I want to be able to say yeah just tell me what you're going for and I will help you answer the the problem or the question um, in a way that that's interesting one of the most visually distinct things about oath to me and what makes it such a different beast from the the previous work in root and vast uh, and fort for that matter um, is the color palette instead of red you have kind of like a magenta-ish color you know instead of blue you have a teal in there like 
what what was your process when trying to settle on a specific color palette when you guys were kind of figuring out the world with oath we with all our games we try and be colorblind friendly with the actual components Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times that just means you have to use secondary information like especially with oath when it's a six player game like we had to make different colored pieces and make them different shapes because always eventually you're going to have two colors that are going to look similar to somebody on uh, and on the different kinds of colorblindness and so i check those against you know an app that simulates it for me um but as a result we don't really have any games at least initially that have red pieces and green pieces um and with root we had uh the the core box has orange and it has green and so with oath i wanted to do no green piece and do a red piece um for for the foxes or for the the fox kind of meeple guy um and so as a result, I didn't want to really lean into any of those colors in in the art because all those pieces have to sit on top of the art. Um, and so I, I made a palette. I kind of got some some doodles that I'd worked on in the past, and I made a palette digitally the same way I would do it traditionally, which is just you know putting out blobs and then mixing them together to make sure that they all kind of go together. So I was creating a green from the, a turquoise that I liked and a yellow that I liked. Um, and so as a result, Oath is a lot of secondary colors. I mean, it has, it has turquoise, it has, um, it has kind of magenta instead of like, like you said, like true red, but root is the same way. Root doesn't really have any true red except for in some of the cards and things, because the palette that I was using, the, or, the red is mostly orange. So if I had to color something like a tongue or, you know, anything like a ruby on, a, on the end of a sword, I would be using this same kind of orange red instead of a true red. Um, and just keeping the palette consistent through the whole project makes it seem like it's its own space. You know, I can look at any one of the, the cards I've done for the games and I can get an initial like feel overall being like, okay, this is kind of a purpley blue thing. It is probably for Vast the Mysterious Manor. This is kind of an orangey pink thing. It probably goes with fort and and making a consistent kind of color story is the easiest way for me to draw a whole bunch of different things and make them seem like they come from the same world because then, then they're all basically like you can say that they're under the same lighting or they're in the same book or, you know, it's just a way of, of thinking about it. So I just come up with palettes the same way I would traditionally just digitally. I just take photos and sample colors that I like. I'm currently doing that on a few projects now with Leader where I'm, I'm saying like, you know, what's a good color story for this or how how am I going to render this in a way where it's still, I mean, no matter what I do, it's going to look like I did it. I, I mean, I, I could try and draw, <laughs> right, I could right. try and draw something dramatically different and say I changed my style completely. And then people would still come up to me at a convention and be like, hey, is this from this game? Like, no, it's not an expansion. It's actually completely different. I thought I had it completely different, but it's not. Um, so I don't worry about like, trying to make it not seem like me. It's always going to do that. But I, I do, uh, you know, use different tools or use different, you know, rendering techniques to, to try and set each project apart from the other projects. How much of the Buckwild world building is, is credited to just your imagination as you were trying to come up with these characters and everything? Because, you know, this this isn't a, a elves and goblins classic high fantasy thing. You were just describing to me the fox meeple piece thing. Like, I don't even know if you have a concrete idea on what these <laughs> representatives, you know, the, oh. the in this universe are. You know, like the, the the genetic makeup of the world of Oath is pretty crazy. Um, was that something that was intentional from the early design docs when this was a game... Uh, a germ of an idea by uh, Cole and Patrick talking with one another? Or was that them saying, well, this is kind of tonally the world that we want to go with. And you were like, well, what if I just have like a guy who's like a ghost coming out of a body? Um, the the thing about um, the way I get to work with leader games being in studio is that I get a lot of I get to throw my weight around a little bit at the beginning of a project <laughs> to to try and to try and help with the right. theming. So when when we did Root, I helped with the theming there. Um, when we did Oath, theming there, I actually came up. Um, Cole Cole told me that he needed 
kind of these different card suits and they need them to interact differently. And so I kind of pitched him this idea of how I would handle the, the card suits. Um, and I made kind of a spectrum of seven things because at that time there were seven cards. But like th this is it. It's just like you lose stuff in the process. Other stuff has to be uh, added on. So we had these seven different card suits. And I said, I've sort of made a spectrum by trying to take slices out of seven different spectrums. So it's like we have, you know, demons and we have the wastes and we have the sword and we have sorcery. But like sword isn't the opposite of sorcery and demons aren't the opposite of the waste. Like you can have all of them. You need to be able to like mix and match. So if you have a world with a lot of demons and magic, it's going to feel a lot different than a lot of demons and order in your world or whatever. You know, it's going to feel feel different. And a lot of those things like got tweaked and changed. So the wastes eventually became the nomad class, uh, the clockwork um, thing got cut completely uh, order or the sword became order. Uh, and then demons became discord. And so they all, they all became kind of their own category. Um, but, but I, I got to heavily influence at least that initial jumping off point of how Cole handled the suits. Um, and then for the characters, um, we knew that we wanted them all to be exiles. Uh, and because we were kind of tapping into this fantasy setting, um, that was inspired by the Chronicles of Prydain, like the book of three and black cauldron books by Lloyd Alexander. Um, we knew that most of, um, the characters or like the, the people, the denizens were going to be human, uh, just, just humans. And there could still be monsters and things, but we weren't going for like dwarves, elves, that sort of thing, just mostly human. And then anything else is kind of an anomaly. So the idea with the exiles was that they all needed to be weird. There needed to be something about them that could either say, you would look at that person or creature and be like, they're outside of polite society but also they could be powerful enough that if they were king then they, or like or chancellor, then they would be like an imposing, like almost like a sorcerer king type figure. So you could totally. have um, when, when we were when I was drawing them, it was like, okay, we have this like sort of anthropomorphic fox guy. He's he's not a root character. He's all lanky and weird. He's taller than like a human is. Very grim. Um, yeah, but if he if he was out of you, you know, so you could see that creature and be like. No, thanks. Like out, I, outside, outside of society, you know, not a regular person, but also if that creature was the, the, the leader like that, like you could see that happening too. So they all became weird and they all, because all the meeples had to be different, they all took on different shapes. So we have, um, I got the box right here. I can look at, we got the, like the blue, the blue guy who's like large and just has one visible eye. Um, and the box guy, like the cloud person, um, and, and they all, and like the, the yellow pawn has four arms, um, and, and they were all weird and different, but that created this interesting visual problem because when we created the chancellor piece to represent all of, you know, anyone could become the chancellor, I showed it to Cole and I was like, how am I going to do that? Because if I make the chancellor a certain shape or dimension, like if I make a skinny chancellor, then someone who is playing the blue player pawn, who's all big and has one eye, they're going to look at that and say, well, how does the blue guy turn into that? Um, so the solution was to make the chancellor just this huge imposing robed figure with a mask. On. Blankets, so many blankets, so many towels, so many blankets. And, and it made it so any one of those other creatures could become the chancellor because the chancellor was just sort of like a, a symbol. You know, and, and there were no direct features on the external that, that would give it away is be like, oh, that has to be the yellow guy because he has four arms or whatever, because because it's just like this shroud with a mask and a, and a crown. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting visual problem to solve. And since then, the chancellor sort of become like the icon of Oath. You know, he has a whole side of the box to, to itself. And um, it's uh, the big purple piece is the largest piece in the box. So. It, yeah, it's fun uh, to, to be able to like um, to be able to get influence how the game feels mm -hmm. uh, when we were uh, e even Fort when we were I mean, to, to take it to Fort when Nick was taking um, Grant Rodex game Grant's Grant's uh, original game that Fort is is taken from is SPQF, which is a, a Roman kind of kind of wordplay joke. Uh, and, and, but they were all anthropomorphic animals. Right. Um, and we're like, we don't want people to buy for it and think that it is a root game. Um, so we're going to approach this differently. And so like, well, what, what ways can we do it? So talking with Nick, we were talking about some of these cartoon shows that we like, like Ed, Ed and Eddie that Nick liked or, um, 
I, I can't remember the other one. I want to say New Kids on the Block, but that is a band and not a. <laughs> hey Arnold, Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Uh, hey Arnold, yeah, that, Ed, that kind of stuff. Or like my kid, my kids love Craig of the Creek, and I think Craig of the Creek is phenomenal. And so we're like, we could kind of sort of come up with this, this you know, class, um, not class, but like different categories of kids based on like clicks, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, or like interests and things that kids are playing outside, and they could be in forts. Um, and so I took the. Um, the original concept for SPQF's categories, and I transposed them onto uh, another one. So, like the, uh, uh, I'm trying, trying to think of the one to one, but like the the agriculture became like the skateboard kids who had snacks on them, you know. And and so a lot of the skateboarding things are like kids carrying the big thing of cheese puffs, or the one kid who's just like eating chocolate or whatever. And they were like the, the sporty, you know, roller skating, rollerblading, skateboarding kids. Um, and then instead of like having con construction and building, we just kind of had like the kids who play in the dirt, like the shovel kids. Um, and, and that sort of put together, um, put together a world that was familiar enough to people and made sense for the theme, but it was just sort of a different angle to, to take that whole thing. And so that, that is how Fort kind of ended up with the theming that it did too. And it has a drastically different color palette than everything else. I mean, that thing is just like pinks, oranges, and yellows out the wazoo. Like, was there a particular inspiration for the 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 palette on that one? Um, we, I mean, Nick and I just looked at a lot of Pinterest boards, <laughs> and, we were, and we and we were thinking kind of like, how do we make this feel like, you know, summery? Because that sure. to me is what I wanted to communicate with Fort was that it's like. Summer break, you know, just when, when you're a kid and you're you're kind of out and and, and escaped, and that's sort of like that where that orange and pink feeling. Um, there's a childish Gambino song that's called "Feels Like Summer." That's yep. all like like kind of pink. Um, the the music video is, and, and, it's, and it's sort of that feeling to me where it's like you can t it's like it's hot, but it's like pleasant. It's like where you want to be, um, and that sort of inspired where where fort ended up being in terms of the box art and the the player aids and everything whether like that. it's fort or oath or root or void lich or whatever you have working on the horizon uh what's your actual process you know you got that spreadsheet you need to work on a card you know how long does an illustration typically take you and how do you organize your day in order to account for what is now hundreds of cards in order to produce for for uh, leader games. Not even taking into account the illustrations for the rule books and maps and any number of other art assets that you have to do. Yeah, maps and box art take a lot. <laughs> take a lot. <laughs> um, the uh, so so one of the things that because when I was in in college, I didn't go to an art school, but my major is a bachelor of fine arts in visual communication. So it was graphic design and illustration. And one of my professors, um, Larry Clarkson, listener, shout out to Larry. Clarkson. Shout out to Larry. He's almost not, <laughs> certainly not listening. He doesn't. He's a wild child. But we um he would break down our grades into kind of three categories, and and he sort mm -hmm. of he wanted us to think about art in a certain way, and it's something that I've really taken with me, which is like. There's there's your your brain and your eyes, and and then your hands, and um, when when he would grade us, it would be on concept, which is your brain, form, mm -hmm. just like how it looks, your eyes, and then craftsmanship, which is your hands, uh, and so you could do something that had a good concept and then not look good and be shoddily made, whatever. But like ideally, you'd want all those three things working in tandem. So when you talk about like how I organize my day, it's funny. And this is one of my things I'm most grateful for working remotely because I'm not in St. Paul where everybody else is, is that like I get so much more done when I can freely, freely do those things. Like I, and I'm not a naturally super organized <laughs> person <laughs> as I feel like probably a lot of creative people struggle with. Um, but uh, the, the thing about those three steps is that only the hands part looks like you're doing anything. <laughs> like if I'm doing concept stuff, it just looks like doodling or it just looks like daydreaming or, or looking at something. Uh, and the same thing with like the, the, the form stuff, like looking at something really hard, looking at other people's art and then trying like, you know, why is this working the way it does? Why is this so good? Why is this evocative? Why does this thing stand out to me? And then like trying to like simulate that and, and like going through it and then 
that the, the, the third step, which is like the actual execution of it, um, is is the work part. And, and for that, my process is I just, you know, I'm here in front of my computer. I have a drawing table right here. That's just a big angled slab. Uh, and then a sketchbook. It's usually this game, the same sketchbook I buy from Benyon Crafts. Shout out to Benyon Crafts. They have they have no idea. This is the other funny thing is that like I have a local craft store that I go in like periodically to buy this specific sketchbook and like these specific Prismacolor pens. And so like <laughs> I spend about like maybe ten dollars a month there. And it's like if they knew how much money that was generating. <laughs> <laughs> With that ten dollar a month for for you know leader games and for the the fourteen people that are now employed there, um, it's just funny for me to think about. But so right. I have this I have this the sketchbook and then I have uh, a drafting pencil um, that is just a super hard lead pencil. Um, it's like six H or something like that. It's really hard. I basically never sharpen this. I use this for a year before I even have to extend it because it's just that wow. hard pencil. Um, and, uh, that's what I do most of my sketching with if I'm going to ink on top of pencil and that, or sometimes I just do ink direct to paper. Like vast had no pencil involved with that. I would just draw direct ink to paper cause I wanted it to look a certain way. Um, and then I'll go back through with a kneaded eraser if I use pencil and then just if I, after I ink it, I can just erase that really cause the hard lead, it makes it really easy to erase. And then I just have ink and paper. Uh, and then I just reached over to my scanner that's right here. And I put, because this is a spiral bound book, I put my classic tales of science fiction and fantasy on top of there that you go. To, make, to make sure it's <laughs> flat against the, the scanner bed. Um, and from there, I just color it digitally. I color things in, in Photoshop. And also I do some composition stuff digitally. If it's a really big thing that I need to do for like, uh, like any of the root covers, for example, I'll draw the background right and left separately or like some of the characters separately so I can get them positioned so they don't get in the way of a logo or the name or anything. Um, so I do some composition stuff digitally. Uh, and but, but most of what I'm drawing is just traditional and then all the coloring stuff is, is digital. So that, I mean, that's, that's my process. Then I send it in the work slack and be like, someone give me a heart emoji on the, on this, you know, if it's good, <laughs> give me my, my validation cookies. And then, uh, and then I just get everything packaged in the right size. It needs to be, if there are certain parameters, get that put on our Dropbox or Google drive, wherever it needs to be. And then our stellar graphic designers like Patty and Nick put them where they need to go. Or, I mean, or if it's still in a prototype phase, then I just send those things directly to Cole or Patrick, and then they use them on cards or, or whatever. And then, yeah. So I mean, it's my game, my day isn't super like. In the morning, I do this, and I just sort of look at kind of what needs to be done, and and plug away at it, and try and pay attention to deadlines. <laughs> Does it ever register to you that the the artwork that you're creating uh, for these games may be the 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 point at which some twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen year old kids are going to start playing these games and go like, oh, I want to become an artist because of how distinct this feels in the same way that you were looking at comic books, you know, that your friends had and seeing something that, that looks completely unlike the, the rest of that hobby, you know, or that medium, you know, the early nineties, the, the look of Todd McFarlane, uh, that, that we mentioned, uh, that, that kind of changed the landscape of what, uh, comics would be for a long time, not just image, but Marvel and DC all kind of went into a new era of illustration. And, especially early on in your career, your games are in such heavy contrast to what illustrations looked like in board games before Vast. Uh, and there there certainly are examples of other cartoonish but playful, maybe a little bit dark, Quan Chai Moria comes to mind. Um, but still, uh, I, I think you are part of this wave of maturing what illustrations can be in uh, tabletop games. Uh, has that clicked with you that, you know, you may be having the same impact on people in the way that some of the things that you were consuming as a teenager had an impact on you? I mean, I hope that happens a little bit. I have, I mean, I have five kids. They all draw. They, they like doing that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I hope that, 
I hope that people take it serious too. I, I, I think that I am extraordinarily lucky to be in the position that I'm in and to think that somebody else would see what I'm working on and be like, I want to do that. I always hope that like, because sometimes we've done panels and people are like, how do I get a job like yours? And I'm like, well, first you have to kill me <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know anybody who gets to do my job the way that I do. And, and I mean, hopefully as board games, you know, more places, you know, start taking on in, in-house designers or things. But I hope people know like how much work like doing freelance art is. Like you mentioned Quanchai, a lot of those guys illustrate for a lot of different publishing houses and, and, mm-hmm. and companies and it's it's running your own business you know it's it's a hustle and i've kind of escaped that that part i've broken through the atmosphere a little bit of like the having to run my own business part we have you know an accountant <laughs> at, right at leader games who does those things that i i hate worrying about well leader games is in such heavy contrast to the rest of the the gaming landscape as far as like these smaller kickstarter companies that started around the same time I mean, like the idea of Patrick saying, I want to hire an artist or I want to hire a lead game developer. I mean, Leader Games has had a, a decent amount of success, but it seems like the the team focus is still a, a, a contrast to a lot of other similar sized uh, companies out there. I mean, Stonemeyer Games, I think, is just now getting its fourth employee or something like that. And Stonemeyer mm-hmm. is huge. Uh, so I, I think the leader in itself is kind of an anomaly. We are. I, uh, I, we are. <laughs> I just think about, <laughs> I just, I just think about the, the people I work with and how extraordinarily lucky that I am because like, I feel everybody is keyed into this idea of like, we're all doing the very best we can with the project that we have. Like the goal is always one, stay alive. Like we're, we're still mm-hmm. trying to make enough money to like, so we can keep doing it. But like, even that sometimes gets shelved a little bit for just like making the best possible thing that we can. Like sh- I, I want someone to get our games and say, this is my favorite game. And there, there's no way that I'm going to like that we're going to ever pivot to like the churn of just like trying to get as many games out as possible or whatever. Like we're always going to make weird stuff, but it's going to be as as passion apparent as possible. I want somebody to look at this and be like, this is the most unique experience ever. And I love when people say that about Oath or Root. Like, oh, this is really different than other games I've played. Or it reminds me of something else in like a very different way. Or like it reminds me of something outside of board games. I mean like, oh, this is like reminds me of a storybook or or whatever. But but even if we can't please everybody, I want somebody to be able to say, this is my favorite game. Like Totally. Totally. In, in the same way, like Cole and I were joking around when a lot of reviews were coming out about Oath, I was like, they have the same vibe as like hot sauce reviews. Where it's like <laughs> pe- people who are into it are like, this is my favorite hot sauce. Big disclaimer, I know that this is not for everybody. And like, if we made a game that somebody said, this game is for everybody, I would, I would like, that would cause me to reflect. That'd be like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, like yeah. I'm not, not because we want to exclude anybody, but, but we just want to make a unique enough experience that it's going to be like, it's going to be the right fit for a, a, a core group of, of board game players who, who, you know, tap into that in a big way. I, I mean, I love, like I, I have, you know, bigger games like like Twilight Imperium and, and other things like that. But just like and a lot of people, you know, build their entire hobby around playing one, you know, big thing they like. But like I, sure, I love sure. the idea of a group of four or five people, three or four people saying like, man, we, we've just played this to death or like they want an expansion because they've played so much of it that they want more stuff. And not the kind of expansion where we're like, we're just trying to fix something with the first release of the game because it came out kind of rushed or you could tell that our heart wasn't in it or whatever. That's never, I, I never want that to be the case. I want somebody to open leader game stuff and, and just be like, you can tell that the people who made this absolutely were fully bought into this as a concept um, and, and just executed it with the, uh, whether it's to everyone's taste or not is not as important to me as it like, if you're into this sort of thing, then it's going to be 
you know, you're going to feel like it was made just for you. <laughs> you know, it's right. gonna... you're not necessarily the the Rolling Stones of the board game world, but you might be the Tom Waits of the board game world, <laughs> which is even cooler. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, we'll see. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just love it. I love my job. I love doing this. I love making things that can bring some happiness to people's lives and and bring them together. You know, I mean, that's. I'm so glad that board games found me in that way that, you know, it's something that, that I got into through doing tabletop role playing game stuff. Uh, and then that, then the board game hobby found me, but I just love the, like, especially compared to like comic books, which I talked about earlier is that like, to me, why I couldn't get into it the same way as I do with board games. Maybe one day I will in some capacity, but like, it's so much work for something that someone is like reading at the pace of reading. And then when they're done, they're like, and and then they might be done. You know, they might never return to that. Whereas like a board game, you're really creating an object that people are interacting with in the same sure. way like a children's book is different than a comics book because you're you're it is just as much about like what it's made of and returning to that space as it is a board game is, you know, the children's books and board games are similar in that way. Um, and and right. I love being able to make, you know, an, an art object in a, in you know a, a playground for people uh you know or instead of making like a toy we're basically making a set of toys for for people to to get and, and open and get into um and I, it's just very fulfilling to me yeah i mean right behind me i have the the illustrations for herloon minotaur and elvish archers by anson maddox from the original run of magic the gathering um, I really like the illustrations in Anson I was raised in Sitka, Alaska. So, you know, that's like shout out to Anson there, fellow Alaskan homeboy. But um, more than anything, like um, I started playing magic at a really young age and that was so tonally different than what fantasy looked like up until that point, even Dungeons and Dragons or anything like that. You know, when I was like a 17, uh, 17, seven year old picking up a Sengir vampire or a Hurloon Minotaur or something, I was like, oh, what is this? This is kind of scary. But it, it was a whole new visual landscape and it was something that I wanted to look at and imagine, you know, what goes beyond the illustration. Yes, this is facilitating the concept from the card, but also, you know, like, what is this world beyond this? Um and also, I, I think a lot about, like, <laughs> that being the Wild West of gaming art when Wizards of the Coast was like, oh, we got this new concept. Okay, um, we need a lot of artists. Just go wild. And suddenly, you know, they had some weird-looking elves and they mm -hmm. had some weird-looking minotaurs just because some college students were like, sure, we'll, we'll do this for stock. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt this stock is going to be of any value, but, yeah, we'll totally do this. So I, I, I think you're right that um, what you're doing with games and the intimacy that you have in uh, your relationship to the cards, to the pieces, uh, I think that sets it apart from, you know, something that's much more linear, like comic books uh, or a lot of other uh, visual art. But you mentioned expansions, people wanting expansions and things that make people happy. And so I think we better conclude this with talking about something that makes me happy, which happens to be an expansion. Yeah. I just opened Cats and Dogs, the expansion to Fort Last Night, man. That is incredible. It is just joy in a tiny little tuck box. Yeah, it's great. We're, I'm super happy with it. We, um, the, uh, when we did Fort, um, originally, you know, I was drawing all these kids and just for fun, we, we asked the people at work like, Hey, send me a picture of you when you were a kid. Um, and I'll try and work it into the, the game. And so I that, knew it, I knew that had uh, to be uh, part of it. At least at the time we had, um, you know, we have a few people from the company that are in Fort. Um, then we went on to do cats and dogs and a couple of people were like, Hey, are you going to do it? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. Like it'll only be people's pets. <laughs> Like <laughs> that that was my main question is was this based off of staff pets the one that i did kind of include is because uh grant uh the the designer of the original fort um has a corgi and so i did look pictures of his corgi when we when we included one in the game but nobody requested any pets or anything because i made them know up front um but, because 
you you wouldn't believe the emails I get all the time for people to get me to draw their pets and things like that. And I just have to be like, no, <laughs> I don't know. Well, for one thing, I don't really have time to do that right now. But I also don't want like to. It, it sort of crosses the line of like, am I drawing official content for you? Right, <laughs> right. To make your am I accidentally endorsing your project with this little thing that that I've done? So, um, but but forts, cats, and dogs is really fun to be able to incorporate lots of different sizes and shapes of animals. And I think it's a solid little expansion, you know, if, especially if you're familiar with Fort, it adds a couple different pathways to score points and, and win uh, the game or some, a couple different approaches. And I think that's the most fun thing about Fort is sort of getting your own little, little engine going. Um, and then, then it fits nicely with the theme, you know, the kids playing out in the yard and stuff. And, and the, the best thing about the, the dogs is that you sort of like, you, you attract them and then you house them in little dog house and, and thing to get points. But the cats are, are like, they're super fickle. And like, if you aren't, if you aren't satisfying the things that they need to stay in your yard, then they just leave and go find somebody else <laughs> yeah. who is. And it's just yep. like, yep. it's very thematic. I think it's a very good way to approach those two things. And, and I love how much it, it like you said, how it adds, even though it's like a small box, you know, if you have the root game or the fort, I keep saying, right. If you have the fort game, you could you could take those cards out and put them in the original box and and not even have to keep the tuck box if you don't if you don't want. But it's it's a good expansion in all those ways where it's like if you want more, then it's more and it works thematically and it's just it's a good and it's not too big either. You know, it's not we're not selling it, you another it fits in the box entire thing. It's just it's little, but it adds a lot. And that's my favorite kind of expansion, I think. Did you have one particular piece in that that you wanted to nail a certain personality type of a dog or a cat or something or or a particular piece that felt very challenging i mean the one that spoke most to me immediately I, i've never owned a husky in my life but again shout out to alaskans <laughs> there are a lot of huskies up here huskies. and i saw echo and i was blown away at how that captures the melodramatic and eccentric personality of every husky that I've ever met. So my uh, my buddy um, had a dog named Mojo, who was a husky, um, and he had really like pale blue irises, um, and so mm -hmm. his pupils are really small. And like, there's just this thing with uh, with huskies where I feel like. If they're if the eyebrow patterning is in the right place and they and they have that white eye, they just look like evil. They just look like yeah. like just like evil, not even wolfish. It's just like just this kind of kind of crazy look on in their in their eyes. And so I wanted to try and do that with with uh, the husky that we drew to sort of just capture that just like mischievous intent. Yeah, yeah. I I feel like uh, it's. It's maybe a creature that's inherently evil, but at the same time <laughs> has no malice or uh, is is pure, is innocent in a way. Maybe its nature is evil, but nothing about its nurture has lent it to be uh, a, a creature of darkness. There, there's something so unique about huskies that uh, I love, but... Um, it, were there any that you like had to do again and again and again, or any that you can think of that were particularly challenging? Um, not, not really. <laughs> it just all came together, huh? I, I like drawing animals. There's no secret there. And I like, and I've always like, especially with cats and stuff, my kids have me draw kitties and things pretty frequently. Um, there's a lot of times in some, some older stuff, um, on my computer, or it'll be like, you know, some troll or something that I was like drawing. And then, but like, there's a couple hidden layers where like my girls had me draw kitties. So there's just like little mm -hmm. cats all over the troll that are just on a hidden layer that I, <laughs> that I <laughs> subtracted out because they were just having me draw all the time. So it was fun to actually draw, you know, kitties for something where they were supposed to be kitties and they didn't have to have swords or armor or, any, <laughs> or anything like that. They were just, they were just cats. So, um, yeah, it was fun to do. Well, I think you've opened the floodgates. People are going to want pet expansions from here on out, but that raises some <laughs> some interesting implications about pet expansions for Root and yeah. what are the pets of the animal kingdoms. Yeah. But we'll leave that for, maybe, you know. Maybe the... there'll be bugs or something. There are no bug things. Um, oh, but the, people want the, it the so bad. The thing is, is that with Oath, that's one of the things that we to ground the world was in a lot of the card art, there, there are dogs and cats and birds mm -hmm. and chickens and things in the background to sort of make it feel like 
you know, a real place or, or people. And so there's, there's a lot, there's a surprising number of, of, of both and things like recurring pigs. Um, there's <laughs> lots of, there's lots of eyes in oath. Um, they're just sort of funny things that ended up being like little secret recurring themes. There's a lot of pie in oath. I feel a lot of olive garden and a lot of pie, a lot of, a lot of pie. Yep. And a lot of memes worked in there or at least one very there's only distinct one meme. meme. So I am, I am super careful not, <laughs> not to do pop culture stuff as, as much as possible in our games because it ages so poorly for one mm-hmm. thing. Um, but, but, uh, I mean, comedy in general, it just poorly, but I, I just, I want to make everything to be like, ah, oh, and I like, but hide your pain. Harold is my favorite meme by like a country mile. And, you know, if I'm ever on a discord where they don't have a hide your pain, Harold em- emo, then I try and add one because I just, it, it captures, <laughs> it captures a feeling so much. And when we got, mm-hmm. we got to a card that was just called Harold. I was like, I got to break my rule. I got to break my <laughs> one rule. It's so perfect. I got to get Harold in there because it's like, it's not the right spelling of Harold. Like I know what a Harold is versus the name Harold. Right. And I, I couldn't put him with a laptop or anything. So I just had like, you know, whatever thing he's reading, his heraldry is just like a curved piece of paper. Um, but I, but I did make it close enough that people who knew what it was would be like, is that that for real? And uh, like, so, so I really try not to work in too much pop culture or like overt, like, hey, you know, from that thing into into the into the humor in the games. But I could not resist putting Hide Your Pain Herald on the Herald card um, for Oath. So if you have Oath and you haven't looked through all the cards, you can find the color card called Herald, and you'll know what it you'll know what it is. It's perfect. And if there's any meme that's going to be timeless and universal, just, it's got to be hide your pain. Harold. I just, I relate to that dude so much. It, since I was a baby, I've always had kind of big, big <laughs> bags under my eyes and I always look a little bit, a little bit tired and stuff. So if you look in Fort, um, if you're playing with the cats and dogs expansion, if you come to the card, that's doodles. And somebody said that they were talking about the doodles card. Like he looks like he's seen some stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's me. That's not, and he hasn't seen some stuff. That's just how I've always looked. I just always had kind of bags under my eyes. That's just the way my eyes look. So um, I I relate with Hide Your Pain Herald a lot. (laughs) Well, everyone needs to pay attention to what's on the horizon for Leader Games. I mean, you got so many projects going right now. I mean, just announced uh, you, well, kind of quasi announced Void Lich has been something that's long been talked about uh, at Leader Games and Patrick Leader still posts stuff online. Uh, You have Ahoy uh, as a project coming up. And then uh, right now the, the, the you guys are coming out with the cats and dogs expansion to Fort and of course, Oath is this darling, amazing game that has uh, kind of taken the, the hobby by storm. Divisive in some ways, but I'm so happy to see that it has largely been celebratory. Congratulations on the achievement for that. And just thanks for coming on to the show, Kyle. Yeah, no problem. Happy to happy to talk. I'll, I'll talk anybody's ear off about board game stuff and about art stuff. Well, I can't wait to have you on next time. Okay. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.